So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you all. I'm afraid uh, not too many of us are wearing the green, but uh, there we go. We'll, we'll take it uh, that you'll do it next year. My name is Randolph Harold, uh, Vice President of CIC National Capital Branch. I'm sitting in for David Dement, our president, who's on his March break, and tonight is toasting the sunset on the deck of a sailboat somewhere in the British Virgin Islands. So it's pretty sad, eh? Pretty sad. I hope it's green beer. Welcome to CIC's Evening with David Halton, our guest tonight on the evolution of political and war reporting. And this is the second hottest place to be after BVI. So, uh, different reasons, of course. David will give us a blast from the past tonight by telling us about his highly acclaimed new book, Dispatches from the Front. He will as well examine the present day controversial proposition that information technology is killing off quality journalism. I think we'll all learn a great deal about the reporting of Canada's role in the world. But first, some announcements for the branch. Uh, let me acknowledge our sponsors for these events, uh, Audiovisual Canada for their continued uh, subsidized uh, service for us, and the Delta City Centre for its continuing support, and especially tonight, the extra super hors d'oeuvres and uh, high quality meal that we're all expecting. CIC's next dinner event is April 30th, and it will be here again in Delta City Centre with Stephen Toop, the new director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. An international human rights lawyer, he's been president of UBC and dean of law at McGill, and he's very well known internationally for his human rights work. So he'll be addressing international human rights and terrorism in the context of the new Canadian legislation. So it should be an interesting night. We continue with our study groups. The Middle East study group is uh, meeting on March 24th, and they will host the Israeli ambassador to discuss Israel after today's elections. And George, you see George Jacobi, uh, if you uh, want to uh, get in on that very interesting study session. The Asia Pacific Study Group, uh, March 31st, will host the former Canadian ambassador to North and South Korea, Marius Grinius, to discuss the Hermit Kingdom with nukes. So that should be uh, an interesting discussion. Marius is uh, quite an entertaining chap. So now on to the blast from the past. <clears throat> David has written a highly acclaimed biography of his father, Matthew Halton. For Canadians of a certain vintage, a veteran Toronto Daily Star reporter, Daily Star, you'll note, uh, and CBC broadcaster Matthew Halton was the voice of World War II. His gripping, passionate broadcasts chronicled victories and losses of Canadian soldiers from Tobruk to El Alamein, from Sicily to Normandy and Paris. He brought the war home to Canadians and became a national hero for his daring reporting from the front lines. Born in Pincher Creek, Alberta in 1904 <coughs> of British homesteader parents, Matthew Halton was to achieve the fastest ever ascent in Canadian journalism in the 1930s. A year after joining the Toronto Daily Star as a cub reporter, he was in Berlin to write about Adolf Hitler's seizure of power, and long before most other correspondents, to begin a prophetic series of warnings about the Nazi regime. <clears throat> 
For more than two decades, he witnessed firsthand the major political and military events of the era. He covered Europe's drift to disaster, including the breakdown of the League of Nations, the Spanish Civil War, the sellout to fascism at Munich, and the Nazi takeover of Czechoslovakia. Along the way, he interviewed Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Hermann Goring, <coughs> Neville Chamberlain, Charles de Gaulle, Mahatma Gandhi, and dozens of others who shaped the history of the century. And tonight, son David will also walk us through some aspects of present day political and war reporting and how the digital age is affecting the role and quality of his profession. These remarks spring from a deep well of experience of his own. David Halton retired not so long ago as CBC News senior correspondent in Washington. One of Canada's most acclaimed journalists, David had been with the CBC television for four decades. He joined CBC News in 1965. A year later, he became the Nationals Paris-based correspondent, reporting on the de Gaulle government, the Six-Day War in Israel, and a coup in Greece. What was that, 67? Hmm? He was CBC's Moscow correspondent between 1967 and 1968, and after returning to Paris in 1968, covered events in the Middle East and the war in Vietnam. In 1971, Halton became the Nationals reporter in Quebec, and three years later returned to Europe as CBC's London correspondent. While based in London, he also reported from the Middle East and interviewed such leaders as Harold Wilson, Menachem Begin, Anwar Sadat, King Hussein, and Robert Mugabe. He returned to Canada to host several CBC news specials, such as the October Crisis, before accepting the position of Chief Political Correspondent in Ottawa in 1978. He co-anchored CBC's coverage of every federal election from 1979 to 1988. And there were lots of them. Canadians came to rely on his considered fair and nuanced reporting on stories with major implications. Joe Clark's rise and fall, Pierre Trudeau's fall and rise, the patriation of the Constitution, the first Quebec referendum, the worst recession since the Depression, well, we got another one, John Turner, Brian Mulrooney, and Meech Lake. Halton became the CBC's senior Washington correspondent in 1991, covering four presidential elections and such major stories as the Clinton impeachment proceedings and the 9-11 attacks. He also filed documentary reports from Haiti, Cuba, Colombia, and Bolivia. Born in Beaconsfield, England, Halton was brought to Canada when he was two weeks old. His father, Matthew Halton, do you remember? <laughs> was a well-known CBC wartime and post-war correspondent. David Halton graduated from the University of Toronto in 1962 with an honors BA in modern history. He then won a French government scholarship to study at the Institute of Political Studies in Paris. In 2005, uh, David Halton was presented with one of the most prized Gemini Awards, the Gordon Sinclair Award for Broadcast Journalism. The award cited his, quote, well-deserved reputation for integrity and responsibility in reporting that brings credit not only on him, but also to the entire Canadian television industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our CIC counselor, David Halton. Uh, it's down there. Thank you very much, Randall, for those very kind words and that encyclopedic uh, 
description of my, uh, my career. Um, it's a pleasure being with you tonight. Uh, it's also uh, a pleasure seeing so many people here who actually know who Matthew Holden was, because uh, one of the reasons what prompted me to write this book was uh, coming back from Washington uh, 10 years ago and finding that apart from a dwindling number of uh, the wartime generation, that remarkably few Canadians had any notion of who Matthew Holton was. Uh, what really troubled me was um, doing the odd lecture at journalism courses across the, uh, across the country and discovering that uh, many students knew a lot about, uh, about Ed Murrow, but they knew nothing about uh, Matthew Holton. Matthew Holton was an unknown name for them. And here was a man who was widely described, as many of you will remember, as the, Ed, the Canadian Ed Murrow. Um, Randolph uh, gave you a sketch of his achievements in the uh, Second World War. Um, as, again, many of you will know, a remarkable 86% of adult Canadians listened to the CBC War News uh, during the Second World War, the kind of ratings figure that would drive current CBC managers <laughs> green with envy. Uh, he achieved during that uh, World War II period um, a reputation and uh, a recognition that probably no other Canadian reporter has had. He did, wrote a lot for British newspapers. He wrote for the Star while he was still writing for, um, for the CBC. He was occasionally used on the uh, American networks, and he was fairly constantly on the BBC. And in 1944, the Association of British Newspaper Pro Proprietors named him as one of the top five war correspondents uh, of um, the Second World War. And you know, I guess it's a Canadian cliche to say that we tend to forget our history in this country, that we tend to be uh, amnesiac about uh, our high achievers and our villains. And this strikes me as a glaring example and it was, as, as I say, this is what prompted me to write the book in the hope of uh, reawakening some interest in, uh, in a Canadian legend and a man whom uh, historian Jack Granitstein has described as the greatest Canadian foreign and war correspondent. Now, I'm sometimes asked, I spent five years researching the book, and I'm sometimes asked, well, did you encounter any surprises? And uh, I ran into a ton of surprises. I guess the first one was the, the thought that I'd be writing a, a biography of a very successful journalist. But I soon uh, realized as I delved into the research that this was also to some extent a, a Canadian saga, a kind of uh, rags to riches journalistic story. My father was the son of a Im highly impoverished Lancashire miner who emigrated to Canada in 1902, lured by the glossy posters that the Dominion government and the CPR was putting up uh, uh, on bus stations uh, in industrial England, which showed um, an expansive farmstead sitting among um, golden wheat fields with a backdrop of the Rockies. Uh, and the caption on these things was, come to the new El Dorado. And they came, of course, because they were promised a virtually free uh, homestead. So here was this mining family. My grandfather had actually uh, uh, gone into the mines as a teenager, uh, who was completely lured by these wonderful ads, um, made his application, and was told that his um, the homestead that was allotted to him would be uh, 17 kilometers south, seven, or probably about 23 miles then south of a place called Pincher Creek, in uh, the extreme southwest of Alberta. It wasn't actually Alberta then, it was the Northwest Territory. And he makes this arduous journey to, um, to Pincher Creek um, with his, uh, his wife and his uh, first two sons. My father was born two years later. Uh, he's shown uh, this uh, homestead property, 65 acres of stunningly beautiful uh, country, right up against the Rockies. 
And uh, it's it's an extraordinary uh, an extraordinary homestead. I b- uh, visited it on a number of occasions. The one problem was that he had no idea how to ranch, uh, no idea at all, and had to buy a few pigs and a few cattle. But soon realized that uh, this was going to be very inhospitable terrain during the uh, winter. The, the, the area was roamed by, by bears and not the kind of visitors you normally uh, run into in Lancashire. And uh, he soon realized that he had to move back into Pincher Creek for the winter, and he was desperate for a job, went to the mayor, and the mayor looked at his papers and said, well, unfortunately, Mr. Halton, the only job we have available right now is the honey dip man. And there are a couple of chatters from older people who've had some experience of rural life in in this country. The honey wagon man was the person who went around on a horse-drawn wagon and cleaned out the outdoor privies because, of course, no one had uh, flush toilets at that point. Um, He soon got the uh, vulgar, if not entirely inappropriate, uh, nickname of Shithouse Halton. And... uh, my poor dad, who'd occasionally go round on the rig uh, helping out his dad, uh, was teased mercilessly uh, at school as Shithouse Halton's son. Despite the rather modest background, I'll fast forward a little bit here. He, he goes to uh, the University of Alberta. He wins a, uh, an IODE scholarship to study at the London School of Economics, where he's uh, mentored by Harold Lasky and becomes uh, a lifelong socialist after that experience. And in 1931, in the fall, he uh, gets a job as a very junior cub reporter at the Toronto Star. Uh, As a cub reporter, he was taking dictation on obituaries, uh, doing occasional night police beat, uh, doing what they called the scalps, which was uh, uh, scalping stories from other newspapers that the star didn't have. And within a year, he's named the CBC's chief, uh, sorry, the star's chief uh, European correspondent. As Randolph mentioned, probably the fastest promotion uh, in Canadian journalistic history. Uh, It's a long story. I'll give you a very shortened version of how it happened. He was noticed that he was a fairly good feature writer. And in the summer of 1932, he was sent up to Ottawa with a group of five senior reporters to cover uh, the biggest conference which until then had ever happened in Ottawa, which was the Imperial Economic Conference of 1932, the summer. Uh, It was a very exciting moment for this country. Uh, Headlines said the empire comes to Ottawa. Stanley Baldwin, the British prime minister, brought over a delegation of 180 British officials, including Neville Chamberlain, who was then the uh, chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, The leaders of all the empire, colonies and dominions converged on Uh, on Ottawa. It was very exciting. The event itself was exciting for about two days, but the problem was that the conference was scheduled to last for three weeks, and the agenda was crashingly boring. It was focused almost entirely on debating imperial preferences and, uh, you know, the cost of tariffs on everything from widgets to you-know-what. Uh, Another key subject was whether um, the gold standard should be enlarged to include uh, other metals. And it was clear that this was an agenda that was sending most people to sleep. On the fourth day of the the conference, uh, my father, very much the junior reporter, probably getting coffee for his more senior colleagues, uh, sits down at the typewriter and writes a parody of the conference, uh, casting all the major characters as Alison in Wonderland uh, characters. Um, R.B. Bennett was the mock turtle. Uh, Stanley Baldwin was the mad hatter. And he writes this piece, and it goes down with the rest of the copy to Toronto. The news editor looks at it and promptly spikes it, which uh, in newspaper parlance means it'll probably never see the light of print. Uh, unless they're really desperate to fill news pages. A couple of hours later, the managing editor, a man called Harry Heinmarsh, comes down, uh, lifts this off the spike and says, what's this? And there there are several witnesses, by the way, for this story. And the news editor says, uh, Bill Riley is his name, says, well, it's just some tripe from the new guy. And uh, 
Again, witnesses corroborate this story. Uh, Heinmarsch, the managing editor, uh, begins reading it, uh, starts chuckling, turns and hands it back to the news edi editor and says, print it, front page, byline. And uh, again, a couple of hours later, Holy Joe, uh, the uh, publisher and editor, Joe Atkinson of The Star, uh, sends a note. He's read it on the front page of The, the Star. He says, uh, I'd like a... Alice in Wonderland parody from that young man, Halton, for every day of the remaining conference, another two and a half weeks. And, and by the way, give, give that young man, Halton, a big fat salary increase. Uh, so he managed to sustain the rest of these Alice stories because he had a near photographic memory. And uh, they had great resonance in Canada because at that point, of course, every young person had read Alice in Wonderland. It was a staple of growing up. So it was a big hit, and uh, R.B. Bennett didn't like it, mind you, but complained. But uh, uh, it was a big hit, and three months uh, later, he finds himself uh, being appointed as the star's uh, chief European correspondent. Again, I'll fast forward a little bit. March 1933 uh, finds him in Berlin on the eve of the Reichstag election that uh, confirms, uh, uh, that seals Hitler's fatal grip on power in Germany. Uh, he arrives at the Adlon Hotel, which some of you may know, it's still there, it was destroyed during the Second World War, uh, just opposite the Brandenburg Gate on the Unter den Linden. He checks in, it's dusk, two hours go by, and uh, as it begins to get dark, he hears this huge chant from the Unter den Linden beneath him. He goes to his balcony. He sees that thousands of, uh, tens of thousands of uh, Berliners are gathering uh, for a torchlight parade by the SS. He watches as thousands of SS and brown shirts uh, come marching down uh, the Unter den Linden. Fascinated, and as he later uh, recounts, somewhat repelled, he goes down to the avenue, crosses the street, watches as a group of the uh, SS uh, stop in front of the French embassy, which is just on the other side of the avenue, and start uh, uh, singing a well-known Nazi uh, war song, Siegreich wollen wir Frankreich schlagen, victoriously we will smash France. Uh, he waits a little bit and then sees a parade of younger uh, Germans, mainly school kids, carrying the swastika flag and shouting, uh, the Jews must be destroyed. He sees four young people uh, who obviously were, weren't supporters of the Nazi regime uh, arrested and thrown into a paddy wagon. It's, that evening forms a lasting impression in a curious way of uh, the evil of the Nazi regime. It frames a, a, a an almost a revelation of what this regime is all about in a curious way. He goes back to his hotel room, sits down at his typewriter, and the lead story he writes is, Germany enters a nightmare, I feel it in my bones, pan-Germanism is on the march again, but in a new and demoniac form. He's only in Berlin very briefly then, but he's back in Germany three months later for an assignment of almost three months which produces uh, an extraordinary series of 30 long, comprehensive uh, articles about almost every defining aspect of Nazi Germany. He focuses very much on the rearmament program. He visits schools and talks of the indoctrination of, of, of boys. He watches 16-year-olds being given uh, fake um, hand grenades and told to throw them against targets. He, uh, he visits SS centers. He uh, visits the Jewish community in Leipzig and uh, writes prophetically of that visit that the terror goes on unremittingly in the form of a deliberate and implacable intention to wipe the Jews out of the economic and social life of Germany. He becomes later the first a uh, foreign reporter to be admitted to the Dachau concentration camp for a visit that's uh, sanitized. He's not allowed to talk to the inmates and so on, but it still gives him an impression of the, uh, the, rep of the repression that is now and terror that is taking hold in Germany. 
Now, what's really, we, all this sounds quite normal looking back from our perspective today, but he was very much a lone voice in writing this, and at this particular time in 1933. And he was widely denounced in Canada as a warmonger and as a sensationalist. The Roman Catholic Archbishop of Toronto advised his flock not to read the Toronto Star. Uh, isolationism was strong. Uh, there were still memories of uh, the massacre of World War I. People in Canada and in the US and Britain didn't want to get involved in distant problems in Europe. So he was very much a lone voice. and. Uh, I said, well, what were other newspapers saying? And I went back to the archives, and I read the Montreal Gazette and the Globe. And at much the same time as my father was producing what became known as the German series, uh, another reporter wrote a series for the, the, uh, the uh, Globe and the Gazette, which was quite remarkable in that it, it praised Hitler for restoring order and stability in Germany. Uh, it uh, said that reports of the repression of Jews and opponents in Germany uh, were, quote, imaginative lies. And it was so, uh, it, it so praised the regime that Goebbels uh, offered this man an interview with Hitler, which, which he did, and which he lavished praise on Hitler. This is what a whole lot of Canadians were reading in 1933. And it was not just in Canada, of course, uh, the same trend was apparent in the US. Even the great Walter Lippmann, uh, in a column, wrote that uh, the exact quote was uh, that uh, Hitler was the authentic voice of a genuinely civilized people. This was the current of what was happening at that point. In any event, uh, my father continued his sort of lone crusade uh, uh, against uh, fascism. Uh, Randolph uh, explained many of the events he covered, the seminal events, the uh, breakdown of the League of Nations, the uh, uh, Spanish Civil War, and so on. And uh, it's interesting, again, comparing the perspective that emerges from his articles and what you'll see in the book with the perspective we have, for example, of Mackenzie King right now. What do we think of King? Well, apart from his sort of nutty attempts to, uh, to communicate with his dead dog and his dead mother, uh, he has uh, the standard historical narrative is that King was a brilliant conciliator and compromiser who uh, bridged regional and sectional differences in Canada, took a, a united country into the, into the war. And yes, he was a follower of, uh, of Chamberlain's appeasement policy, uh, but that was pretty much what most of the Western leaders were doing at that time. The picture that comes from my father's writings is a much more negative picture of Mackenzie King's record in dealing with foreign policy and specifically with Germany in the 1930s. Uh, it documents how King was the person who vetoed a key effort in 1935 by a Canadian representative of the League of Nations uh, to impose tighter sanctions on Italy after its invasion of Abyssinia. Uh, within, I think it was 48 hours, I'm sure some former diplomats here will know when uh, King uh, and his uh, assistant, O.D. Skelton, vetoed this. And King shortly afterward was uh, reported as telling uh, the governor general that, uh, I think the, I've got the exact quote somewhere here, here, I hope the League of Nations could be got out of the way altogether. Uh, in 1937, uh, King goes on to an imperial conference in London where his, estab his reputation as an appeaser is so well established that Lord Halifax and other uh, arch supporters of the appeasement policy in Britain come to him and try to persuade him behind the scenes to uh, lead the charge to get rid of all sanctions uh, in the League of Nations. Uh, my father and the Winnipeg Free Press person get wind of this. They're well connected in London and they write a story, and the London Times correspondent uh, picks it up in Ottawa. Yes, there was a London Times correspondent in Ottawa then. And um, it comes back to London, and uh, King uh, denies the story. A few months later, he's actually in Berlin to become the first, uh, I guess, major Western leader to uh, have uh, a long session with, uh, with Hitler. 
Uh, my dad's outside the, uh, the presidential palace on the Wilhelmstrasse as uh, King comes out. Normally Hitler has meetings of about uh, half an hour at most with foreign leaders, but this was an hour and a half, a clear indication that they'd got on pretty well. King comes out and says uh, very little. It was a reassuring meeting. He says, I'm very reassured, and that was about the sum of it. 30 years later, we learn when King's diary was published that on that same night, he writes in his diary uh, a long couple of paragraphs comparing Hitler to, uh, this is a, unbelievably, to Joan of Arc, saying that uh, he's uh, embracing, quote unquote, constructive policies in Germany and uh, describing his uh, essentially as a man of peace. Um, it's quite remarkable to read that. Uh, after the Munich Agreement, uh, King describes uh, Neville Chamberlain as one of the greatest statesmen who's ever lived. And two years after that, he describes of another British politician that he's one of the most uh, dangerous politicians I've met. You can probably guess who that uh, politician was, Winston Churchill. Uh, so, again, uh, our perspective now on the 30s and particularly on Canadian foreign policy uh, is a lot brighter than the rather bleak picture that comes out, which is a useful one, I think, to consider of the 30s as not being a glorious time for Canadian foreign policy, particularly, too, when you think that uh, Canada, our country, was uh, uh, the worst country in terms of refusing uh, Jewish emigrants from, uh, from Nazi Germany. By the end of the 1930s, my dad's built up a, probably a higher international profile than just about any Canadian journalist uh, before or since. Randolph has mentioned these incredible interviews with, uh, with Roosevelt. He was uh, given an assignment in Washington for a couple of months. Um, he also had an incredible scoop uh, when he uh, was asked to come over with a, a photo team to, uh, to get uh, uh, pictures of the royal family in 1939 before the famous visit to Canada in, uh, in 1939. And uh, at that point, uh, and almost to this day, the protocol dictates that you don't interview the royal family uh, except on extremely rare occasions. Uh, he goes into this interview, there were two interviews actually, it was one in, in Buckingham Palace, one at, uh, um, at Windsor Castle, uh, pictures are taken, and um, a day after the, uh, these photo sessions, uh, he's called by the uh, palace and said he could, uh, could write about the interview, which is enormous scoop, which uh, the star um, picked up and, and, and gave them an enormous amount of kudos. Uh, uh, I was determined when I set about writing this book not to write a hagiography, that I would uh, deal and examine um, my father's faults and uh, errors both as um, a correspondent and as a human being. On the uh, judgmental side on his work, um, there were a number of uh, errors. He was um, a huge Francophile. He loved France and he'd... Uh, find any excuse to get over to France to interview an obscure cabinet minister in, in the 30s because he, he so enjoyed Paris. And uh, he, um, this sort of uh, Francophile feeling of his blurred his uh, vision when it came to assessing um, what was happening in France at the end of the 30s. And he under, uh, underestimated the, the defeatism and war weariness that would lead to Vichy and to collaboration with the, uh, the Nazis. Um, another um, questionable uh, aspect of his and all the war correspondents' work in covering uh, the Second World War was the cheerleading aspect. It's fashionable for uh, uh, post-war revisionist uh, his media historians to talk about the fact that the war correspondents were cheerleaders, were to some degree propagandists. Um, the cheerleading aspect was partly true, uh, partly the result of the rigorous censorship where uh, you couldn't talk about uh, the losses, Canadian casualty numbers, uh, you couldn't talk about collateral damage, uh, and so on. But reading in uh, all of my uh, transcripts of, of my dad's wartime broadcasts and uh, print articles, uh, I found that they stand up pretty well. And they certainly 
did not try to sanitize the war. In fact, um, he was often so bleak in his, uh, his telegraphing of the ferocity of the battles taking place that the government at one point uh, got to CBC and asked him to, to tone down his, uh, his reporting. Um, on the human side, my, uh, my dad's uh, personal life was somewhat tumultuous during the uh, Second World War. He was a prodigious drinker. Uh, he, like a lot of the, four cor the correspondents at the time, uh, he slept through the biggest night of bombing of the London Blitz. He was staying in the Savoy Hotel, and uh, down the corridor was uh, another young man called James M. Menefee, Don M. Menefee, uh, then working for the International Herald Tribune, who went on to, um, to become a CBC war correspondent himself. A delayed action bomb... Uh, went out just beside the hotel. It blew out windows. There were about 14 serious injuries. Uh, Menefee's left eye was, was, uh, was completely borne out. He was half blind for the rest of his life. Uh, but my dad slept right through till noon the next day. Uh, another example, he was uh, in Torgau on the Elbe River when the Red Army met up with the Americans, historic moment. And uh, the Soviet Army put on a a gargantuan party that lasted 10 hours with vast amounts of cheap Soviet champagne and cognac, of which uh, my dad apparently availed of himself fully. And uh, he wrote my mother a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, days later saying that for a four-hour period he had no memory of what happened until a Canadian conducting officer told him that uh, he'd gone out with a Soviet colonel and they'd thrown uh, bottles of, of cognac at targets in the street. Um, an indication, again, of uh, some fairly massive drinking binges. Uh, I learned, uh, to a mixture of surprise and voyeurism, uh, that uh, in the four and a half years he was away from my mother, and it was a very good marriage, that he had a number of flings. Uh, one of them was when he was, became one of the first correspondents to uh, enter liberated Paris. Fighting was still going on. Uh, he gets um, halfway towards uh, the Seine River, and there are roadblocks. Uh, there's still tank fire going on, shelling going on. Uh, he was told he can't go any further, and he wants to get across the river to the, to the right bank. And he calls, the, uh, calls up the, um, the, uh, the Maquis, the French resistance, and says he's here, wants to witness this historic moment. And uh, they say, well, we'll send a car for you. And uh, 20 minutes later, uh, a big old Citroen arrives with uh, two resistance fighters in the back. And uh, riding on the dashboard, this uh, gorgeous blonde resistance fighter called uh, uh, de Sonfort, Christine de Sonfort. How do I know this? Well, I was reading uh, uh, letters that poured out of one of the obscure box in the archives, and they turned out to be love letters from this woman uh, to my father. She felt rapturously in love with him. When she first sees him, she embraces him, and the correspondents were in uniform then, so she said this, you're the first correspondent I've seen in, uh, in, uni in allied uniforms for four and a half years, and that is the beginning of a short but uh, uh, tumultuous uh, affair. Um, I'm looking at my time because I want to get to the uh, second part of this very quickly. Um, Post-war, briefly, um, I start the chapter with an epigraph saying that uh, Matt won the war but lost the peace. Uh, in London, he becomes the CBC's uh, chief, uh, chief correspondent. Uh, he gets the Order of the British Empire from King George VI. Um, He's asked to run for parliament both in Canada and in Britain. He becomes, in a way, Mr. Canada in London, the person the BBC and others turn to on any major Canadian story. But there's a sense of uh, anticlimax because uh, when you've escaped from behind enemy lines in a raging battle near Alamein, when you've uh, been at Ortona in the courtyard of hell, as he put it uh, very graphically, when you've uh, been in the assault wave on D-Day, when you've liberated Paris, when you've been in the same room in Berlin when Marshal Zhukov uh, takes a surrender from Field Marshal Keitel, uh, every story after the war, no matter how important, uh, becomes something of an anticlimax. And uh, I think he felt that, in a curious way, that he was uh, uh, on a downward slope in life. Well, it might seem odd to make the transition 
to the subject of current journalists and how journalism has evolved since my father's time, but I think you'll see that there are uh, some links. And what I'd particularly like to advance is the uh, very debatable argument that uh, the quality of journalism has in many ways declined as uh, information technology, particularly the internet, has surged ahead. Now, uh, I, I'm not a total Luddite. Uh, I recognize that there are absolutely fabulous aspects to the internet. If you have the money to pay for the paywalls, if you know how to navigate the internet, uh, it, is, it is a marvelous uh, institution. I'm a news junkie. I subscribe to the New York Times, to Haaretz, to the Wall Street Journal, to Le Monde, and so on and so on. And it's a, it's a fantastic source. However, most people, when they access the internet, do so through social media, through blogs and the Twitter universe, where information is all too often unfiltered, uh, unchecked, and biased, where there are no standards of accuracy, where there are no editors or gatekeepers to uh, double-check facts, and where, as you know, where just about anyone can post just about anything. By coincidence, yesterday, uh, the Associated Press published a survey of the millennial generation, those between the ages of 18 and 30s, that was carried out by the American Press Institute. It was very revealing. Two-thirds of those who were polled said that they got their news online, mainly from social media and the websites of newspapers or broadcast news. Sorry, not the websites of newspapers and broadcast news. Now, rather than seeking out news on the internet, the survey showed that 60% said that they mostly, quote, bump into the news as they do other things on Facebook, Twitter, uh, and other sites. Some of them mysterious to me. Uh, um, Reddit, has anyone heard of Reddit? Uh, <laughs> Tumblr and so on, uh, total mystery to me. Uh, but that shows again that I do have a Luddite side. And of course, on these sites, they probably find a lot of good information, but they also f f find a lot of disinformation as well. Now, there are other damaging, if unintended, consequences of uh, information technology, in my view. Um, the basic function, it seems to me, of a journalist, uh, and I, I know this sounds simplistic, is to bear witness, to be there, to go out, to interview people, to uh, provide the context and analysis that really explains uh, a story to viewers or listeners or readers. Uh, when I think of my dad's writing uh, in the 1930s, especially in that German series I mentioned, uh, he would find it too expensive, or the star would find it too expensive to uh, telegraph a story unless it was a really important hard news story. So most of his uh, articles were sent back in the mail. They arrived 10 days later. There was no deadline pressure. There was ample time to provide the context, analysis, and interpretation that, I, that made those stories uh, so gripping. Now, when I started as a reporter in 1967, uh, I was in Paris, uh, and I had the same luxury of having time basically to get out and report and uh, to meet people and to provide that kind of context, partly because we sent our, our stories back on film then. Uh, it was too expensive to satellite them in most cases. And so when we sent it back by film, we designed our story so it would hold up for the next day and subsequent days. Again, with the result that uh, I think arguably it provided the uh, viewer with more context and more analysis and, uh, analysis and more of what was actually going on in a country than if, if it had been based on the kind of emphasis on immediacy and breaking news and up-to-the-minute news that we find in the current context, especially with the uh, 24-hour uh, news. Today's deadlines make it much harder for reporters to do those functions of getting out and witnessing. Because of the internet, 
they have not only to service their main channel, whether it's the national at CBC or their newspaper, but also their organization's websites, uh, which have to be updated constantly on a big story. They have to tweet. I was amazed uh, to see during, I think it was the, uh, uh, the, the demonstrations in Tahrir Square a few years ago, that uh, senior CBC correspondents were tweeting 10,000 in the square now, half an hour later, crowds swollen to 25,000. And it seemed to me that those people should be out actually talking people and, and gathering useful information rather than uh, wasting time, in my view, on tweeting. But there again, uh, here perhaps is the uh, Luddite speaking. Um, there's also the issue of um, news consumers shifting from laptops to, uh, to smartphones, and now I guess the latest device will be the, uh, the Apple iWatch. Uh, I sometimes wonder if it would be, what would happen if my father's 30 series long articles um, had to be translated into the Twitter world of, uh, what is it, uh, 140? Uh, words, uh, characters, uh, and the world of the iWatch. Then, of course, there's the, uh, quite separately, the, the massive economic uh, impact of uh, information technology. The fact that there's been this huge drain of ad revenues from uh, newspapers and, to a lesser extent, from uh, the broadcast media, uh, which has had, I think, a, a pretty devastating uh, impact uh, on quality journalism. Uh, as a result, newspapers on average have shrunk in size by 30% uh, in North America. Uh, 16,000 newspaper jobs have been lost. 26% uh, of all magazine jobs have been lost. Some of these jobs, but relatively few, have been picked up by digital media. But it's still uh, a serious drain on journalistic talent. Uh, the fierce pressure to hold readers to uh, uh, stem up ratings against the kind of losses that news organizations face has led to the news light trend, the emphasis more on entertainment than information. Uh, you know the formula, crime, uh, uh, more health stories, more so-called news you can use, which uh, I think is, offers a, a serious dangers to serious journalism. As regards foreign correspondence, um, the situation is especially bleak. Uh, now there are almost two-thirds fewer Canadian foreign correspondents than there were uh, two decades ago. Uh, some of you will remember the glory days of Southern News, when uh, Southerns had seven or eight absolutely first-class foreign correspondents. Now you look at their successor, uh, Post Media, what do they have? Well, they have the roving correspondent, Matthew Fisher. Uh, they have someone shared in Washington. I don't believe they have a correspondent in London. I may be wrong on that. But the same pattern of downsizing and layoffs has happened and closing of bureaus has happened right across the Canadian journalistic spectrum. Uh, CBC, Star, and Globe uh, all suffer uh, as well. One consequence of having fewer foreign correspondents is that, of course, you don't have a Canadian perspective on the world. You don't have a Canadian eyes uh, examining and reflecting our national interests abroad, which often are different from American or British interests, and which are important to reflect because, if only because we were an important trading nation. And uh, you know, some people will say, well, what does it matter? We can to use the New York Times service or the Daily Telegraph service and get high quality journalism. But the fact is that uh, American and British uh, news media uh, almost completely ignore uh, a Canadian point of view or Canadian news. So we are badly shortchanged uh, in that respect. Another aspect, just briefly, of uh, of having fewer foreign correspondents is the uh, tendencies for, uh, towards what we call melts in the business. Melts are when a correspondent sits in Toronto or London or Washington and does a story that may have happened thousands of kilometers away, but he gets agency pictures and wire service copy, and he or she puts together um, often a very good piece, but one which suffers again from the fact that uh, there's no witnessing of the events. 
There are other unintended consequences from the internet uh, that have a negative impact. Uh, I leave it to sociologists and uh, philosophers to expound on uh, a so-called atomization of the internet, the fact that with the uh, vast sources of points of contact, uh, society no longer has a unifying uh, knowledge base derived from sharing uh, the same relatively few uh, numbers of traditional news sources. Uh, nor will I deal with the arguments uh, that, polar, that uh, the internet I accentuates polarization. There have been studies that show that uh, there's a strong tendency for um, people to turn to internet blog sites uh, that reflect and reinforce their own political prejudices, whether of the left or right. And the traditional notion of a distinction between fact and opinion is getting increasingly blurred in the blogosphere. Uh, I don't want to be too alarmist about this, uh, this topic. Uh, much fine journalism is still being done in this country and abroad. Uh, and let's hope it continues despite the uh, adverse pressures from uh, IT. I look forward to any questions or comments that uh, you may have, um, either about the current state of journalism or about uh, my biography of my dad, which uh, I hope you will enjoy reading as much as I enjoyed writing it. Thank you. And on the subject of, of uh, journalism, we happen to have here this evening uh, Chris Waddell, who is uh, director of the School of Journalism at, uh, at Carleton, uh, an acknowledged expert in the field, much more so than I am. So perhaps we could ask uh, Chris to um, uh, lead off and uh, shoot down any or all of the views that uh, I've advanced tonight. Uh, there, that's fine, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so that, that works? Yes. Thank you very much, David. Um, it's sort of, I had the pleasure of working with David at CBC for, uh, for quite a long time. I was, when I went to CBC, I was asked to produce a national, and all of a sudden I was going to be the producer supposedly in charge of people like David, Joe Schlesinger, um, Don Murray, Patrick Brown, names you may know, and I was pretty frightened, but they were, they were all wonderful. And it's an example of the type of person that David is that he invites me to come tonight to tell him that he's wrong, which, um, <laughs> which I'm going to partly do. Uh, there's a lot of what he says he's right about. There's a, some of what he says he's not right about. Um, uh, I think when you say, certainly young people get information in different ways than they got information before. That doesn't mean they're not getting the information. They're getting, they're finding it in different places. Uh, Twitter, not so much. Facebook, much more. Facebook is much more powerful than Twitter. And, and lots of things get posted on Facebook that people see. They don't read newspapers. They don't watch television. Most of them don't have television subscriptions. If I was in the cable news business, I'd be very worried because most young people can't afford both television subscriptions and internet subscriptions, so they don't get television. Um, I can't imagine what's going to happen when they get to be 27 or 28 and they decide all of a sudden they have to start spending $80 a month for a cable TV subscription. So I think the cable news business is in big trouble. The cable business is in big trouble. Uh, but I think they still get lots of information. I think we're, we have a lot of challenges in that there's a lot of new technologies coming at the same time. We don't um, necessarily use them all the best way they could be used, but uh, Twitter has its uses and it also has its wastes. Um, some of the things did, David didn't talk about is that technology now allows us, as journalists, to go places and report from places we could never report from before and do it right away. So you know what happens. Uh, you can get into parts of Syria. Some places are too dangerous to get into, but journalists have gone in at various points. They've gone other places. We can see things for ourselves we couldn't see before. Uh, journalism, though, also faces a huge challenge in that David has mentioned. Uh, the, um, the upheaval on the advertising side is an enormous problem. Uh, newspapers have traditionally relied for advertising, on advertising for about 80% of their revenue. About 20% has come from subscribers. Um, television, over-the-air television, um, gets about 100% of its revenue from advertising. The advertising market is disappearing and it's not coming back. Uh, starts, that started with a recession in 2008. Just to give you a couple of numbers, in the U.S., uh, 
2005, there was about $47 billion spent on advertising in newspapers. In 2013, it was $17 billion, and it's not going up. Um, newspapers thought that they could tr make the transition from, um, from print advertising to online advertising, and advertisers would move online. For every $16 newspapers get in print advertising in the U.S., they get $1 in online advertising. The bigger problem they face is a lot of that advertising is actually not sold by them anymore. It's now sold by Google and sold by other people. So Google and, and people who can geo-target markets and geo-target uh, audiences can sell it. Um, advertising sold online is sold for a lot cheaper than anything over the air yet, or anything in print and in television, yet you can um, much more precisely determine who your audience is uh, and, and what the response is. So news organizations are having a great deal of trouble trying to figure out how to survive in that world. They tried to get us to pay more through paywalls. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I think, I'll just finish up with one quick comment, and that's, I think there's some, well, two. Number one, in that whole period, news organizations have made a lot of bad decisions. Um, it was a bad decision to give away the internet for free. Um, it was a bad, it's, I think it's been a bad decision to face the sort of cutbacks they faced and still maintain the fiction that they can deliver everything they used to deliver. And I think news organizations probably need to more, be more brutal in determining we're going to cover some things and we're not going to cover other things. And we'll, we may get there. Um, the good news and the good side of it is, uh, that David kind of touched on, is if you um, ride a bus, if you drive past a bus stop, if you go at a bank and see people uh, uh, lining up at an ATM, what's everybody doing these days? They're all looking at, many people are looking at smartphones. Uh, they're looking at information that they're getting through mobile devices, and mobile devices is a huge opportunity for existing news organizations and for new news organizations to find ways to gather um, information and deliver it, to, uh, deliver it to, to people. So I think there's a great opportunity there. I'll finish up with two last really quick points. <laughs> the other challenges that news organizations face is, of course, their uh, workforce is all totally outdated uh, and is not the right workforce for the business they're in at the moment, whereas young people are. And the other problem that newspapers and television networks and the whole media struggles with is that no one has any idea anymore what the audience knows about stories when they come to your product. When, like, as, if I'm putting out a newspaper, I don't have a clue. I've got to put out a newspaper in the morning for some of you who have read everything because you've been reading online all day and some of you who have read nothing. Well, how do I do that? How do I do a newscast when I don't know what it, the range of knowledge of members of the audience is about the issues that appear in newscasts and in newspapers? It covers the total gamut of, of from nothing to everything. And yet you've got to figure out what's the right place in there at a time when you really don't know what your audience is interested in anyway and you're asking them for more money. It's a really difficult and challenging environment. I don't disagree with much of what David says, but it's a very complicated world these days. But I think it'll be more interesting in the future. Uh, all good points, uh, Chris. And while we're waiting for anyone else who might have a question, uh, excellent points. Uh, I would just say as we wait that uh, you mentioned the uh, you know mob mobile phones, smartphones, and so on, and increasingly people getting information there. The media uh, of the of high technology tends to encourage, as I mentioned, brevity. Uh, and a kind of headline approach to the news where you don't get the kind of reflective reporting which you would get from, from other media. I would make that point. I'd also say that uh, a lot of the uh, major news organizations try to lure people in by offering it free and then start later on, once they're hooked, uh, charging, sometimes very fairly heavily. Uh, and that most of the young people, certainly I've talked to, they're not prepared to pay for, for news. So they tend to end up on, on Facebook and other sources, which is an, an, an access information which is not always reliable. Yes, sir. I wonder if you could comment on the, um, the danger that reporters face now compared to in your father's era. We see now reporters having to go into very dangerous circumstances. Some of them are kidnapped and killed. How would you compare that with the circumstances that your father and his generation faced? You've described the situation perfectly well. In my father's time, and I, I've covered five wars, but uh, most of them uh, predictable in terms of uh, a certain front line. You know where the front lines are. You know where the, uh, uh, the other side's lines are. And you can make kind of, uh, you can take risks, but considered risks. And now, as you mentioned, um, in Syria or Iraq uh, with uh, IS uh, kidnapping people, 
uh, there's no such predictability, which means that fewer senior correspondents, unfortunately, are going into those areas. Uh, often, I mean, the, chap, the chaps we saw beheaded were, uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, were, were freelancers um, who, who were, wanted to make their reputation and were prepared to take colossal risks uh, of, of a kind that uh, uh, increasingly senior correspondents are not prepared to take because, uh, after all, what is the worth of a dead correspondent to uh, his or her news organization? There was a very interesting article in The Citizen today where a journalist had the opportunity to interview a gentleman who he got through an, uh, a fellow in, uh, I believe it was in Venezuela, who admitted to being a professional kidnapper. Mm. And it was an unbelievable story. I don't know if you get a chance to read it, but good on the journalist who went to, to Caracas, I believe, or somewhere to actually interview this gentleman and... He admitted to being a professional kidnapper. Hmm. Crazy. It's chilling. It's very chilling. Sorry, we have a question right yeah. over here first. Um, David, with your permission, I'd like to seek a qualifier from Chris, if I may. Um, you've spoken, to David's point, about the abundance of information on Facebook. Could you speak to the question of accuracy and substance? Yeah, it's... it's it, it, some's accurate, some's not accurate. One of the problems of, in, of the growth of information is that much more of the, um, what was the word? Much more of the requirement is being placed on you to sort out what's right from what's wrong. And, and that you're also now being forced more to actually search around for information rather than finding it all in one place. Um, the, the material that gets posted on Facebook is in some cases simply just um, uh, uh, a link to a story in a, news, in, a, in a newspaper, in a news organization, or, or a television story, or video. Uh, I think there's a range of accuracy. Some of it's accurate, some of it's not. I mean, it's, it depends. Again, it comes down to, and that's where existing news organizations have a real opportunity, if they can make transitions, to take advantage of the, uh, of, of the credibility they have for what they've done in the past, and say that in a world where you can't figure out what's right and wrong, we're at least a trusted source that you can come to. And the question is, how do they do that, and how do they make that transition? Thank you. A couple things I heard that was quite interesting in terms of the proliferation of news and media sources, which is great for those of us who, like you, David, are junkies. We love to hear everything that's going on. But it also strikes an interesting problem in terms of the career, in terms of being able to make a living out of that. So either you're uh, an employee of a news organization, and obviously it sounds like there's fewer and fewer of those, or you're risking your life and sometimes losing it when you go out to places like Syria and Iraq, try to do a story. What do maybe you and Chris could uh, uh, both uh, comment on? What does this mean for a career? professional career in journalism, however you define journalism. Well, I'm often asked uh, by journalism students, well, how do I become a foreign correspondent? And uh, obviously one doesn't want to discourage them, but because of what I mentioned earlier, uh, two-thirds fewer foreign correspondents uh, than there were uh, two decades ago, it's uh, difficult not to be a little pessimistic. Uh, I usually tell them that there are two routes they can go. One is to uh, join a, a, an established newspaper or television station, uh, work their way up the ranks, a classic route, uh, and hope to, by their talent, they can get to, uh, abroad as a foreign correspondent. The other route that, in, in, in a way, I, I tend to favor uh, is for uh, a young co uh, aspiring correspondent to go abroad as a, a freelancer, to choose an area or a country that he thinks might be in the news and where there are no resident Canadian correspondents, and uh, begin writing from there. That was actually more or less the route I took when I was a student in Paris. Uh, I began freelancing, and uh, it was a slow, painful start, but gradually it, uh, it picked up, and I ended up uh, uh, doing some work for the Toronto Star, among others. Um, so that's what I, I, I tell young uh, students who, who are, are aspiring uh, correspondents, but uh, it's not a growth industry. Um, there are a certain amount of digital uh, jobs that are creating, but not enough by any means to offset uh, the jobs that are being lost in, uh, in newspapers and uh, broadcast media. So it's, it's not a great picture. Uh, I'm always... Um, sorry to see uh, the numbers of uh, 
fine journalism students that have probably passed through Chris's class who end up uh, uh, as government PR spokesmen. Not that that isn't a very useful and necessary job, but I sometimes think it's a, a waste of potential talent. I, I would only add two things to that, one of which is that, um, in fact, I would agree, agree completely with David's point about going somewhere. And the, the, the real advantage you have now is technology is so cheap, easy, uh, good quality, and easy to use that if you take a digital SLR and a com laptop computer, you've got everything you need to actually be a journalist and file material to, lot, to, to print, radio, broad, um, um, uh, websites, and everything else. Um, the other thing I think is that there are new and different news organizations coming up that are taking the place of some of the existing ones. There are opportunities there. Uh, I think the, the really big picture question that, that, um, that no one has really tackled, and I don't know what the answer is, is I was a journalist in the, in the last 20 or 30 years at a time when journalism, um, the pay for journalists went up quite substantially. For a long time in, in history, journalism hasn't been a particularly well-paying profession. And the question, I think, is we move to an environment where more and more employers are wanting to put people on contracts or, or wanting to um, have them as casual employees. Uh, and as we move to new startup and smaller news organizations that don't have the resources, so don't pay people as much, the question is whether young people can still get jobs. There are still lots of opportunities, and we have you know, only about a third of our undergraduate students want to go into journalism anyway. Um, uh, there are opportunities for them. They start out at not very much money. I think the challenging question is whether they're ever going to be able to make more than little bits of money. And I don't know. Um, thanks very much, Chris. I wonder, it, it also... Uh, possibly raises uh, serious questions of accreditation. I mean, how do you know uh, there's some freelancer who's operating in, in Syria? Uh, what, what's their background? What's the, uh, what's the intent of the reporting? Um, I mean, how do you uh, judge that uh, when you don't have, uh, you know, uh, professional accreditation involved? Well, in, in most cases, I think uh, on major news organizations, you have people who would have checked them out, visiting correspondents who uh, had perhaps used them as fixers, which is what uh, visiting correspondents often do in these countries. Uh, so they would be able to, to vouch for their, uh, their authenticity. Um, but a, another issue that, that often comes up in the video world now is that the emergence of videos from the front lines, either Syrian or in or um, opposition, uh, of sometimes dubious quality. Uh, they're used because they're usually wonderful graphic pictures, but uh, there's no, no one who can vouch for their accuracy. There was a case uh, a few months ago of a very uh, touching story of a young boy who was, uh, you may have seen this, who was uh, uh, about to be grabbed and he was saved by someone else, and it turned out to be a complete fake. Um, so a lot of that kind of uh, citizen reporter kind of uh, video is emerging now, sometimes of, uh, of dubious uh, authenticity. Great. Um, could I ask you to come up to the microphones the way that uh, Bob uh, Haig is doing uh, and identify yourself when you're asking the question? Uh, He's already told you who I am. Yeah, uh, <laughs> primarily Mr. Halton, because I, a lot of this is being recorded. And, uh, thank you for nice a very to... enlightening uh, presentation. You've mentioned uh, the Globe and Mail. You've mentioned the Sun or the Star. You've mentioned uh, Post Media. You haven't said a lot about CBC, your former employer. Uh, do you have any comments on uh, its future, its news gathering capacities, uh, how you sure. uh, see its, uh, its going? Well, on the news gathering capacity, uh, certainly in terms of foreign reporting, uh, the CBC numbers hold up. There is a, 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 a cut of about three or four senior correspondents. There are bureaus that are closed, but they're now turning to uh, what they call one-man bands, um, usually younger reporters um, who aren't married and therefore the CBC doesn't have to pay for housing or uh, education costs. Um, they go to um, foreign locations and um, they do everything. They edit their stuff, they, uh, they shoot it. Um, I've always argued that uh, it's great to have a few of these videographers around, but 
If you're worried about editing and exposures and so on, that means a little less time devoted to actual reporting, so I'm a little skeptical of that. Um, and what it means is that um, senior reporters, senior who aspire towards uh, being foreign correspondents, they tend not to go because, as I said, the, they've cut down drastically on the support level of allowances that are um, offered correspondents. So we tend to be getting more of these uh, uh, one man or one woman bands uh, going abroad. Uh, overall, I mean, the picture is is bleak, and uh, you're as familiar with it uh, as I am. Um, the um, the money is is far less. Uh, the uh, some people say, oh well, well perhaps uh, with a change of government things will improve. But uh, uh, we've said that in the past, and uh, by almost by definition, with the CBC's role of providing critical scrutiny of government. Uh, we haven't won a whole lot of friends uh, in the Liberal Party, going back to Chrétien and Trudeau. Uh, um, so I'm not betting a huge sum of money on the fact that things will turn around for the CBC uh, if there's a, a change of government in the next election. I will say they can't get much worse than they are right now. Uh, uh, Jerry Wright, Wright. Uh, a lot of people in this room, David, uh, <coughs> have had public service careers, at least at the more senior ones, and uh, have undoubtedly, over the course of those careers, had to throttle the temptation to uh, leak information to, uh, uh, to members of the press. Uh, on the other hand, they could, and they can't even today, any day, pick up the New York Times, and invariably there will be an article beginning according to a senior official whose name cannot be given because he is not authorized to speak on this subject. Uh, leaking, obviously, is a, a standard operating procedure in, uh, in Washington. Now, you've worked in both Ottawa and Washington. Uh, with the objectivity that you've undoubtedly acquired in retirement, uh, could, you, uh, <laughs> could you tell us, uh, do you admire more a culture of openness in, in Washington uh, as opposed to a culture of... Uh, which puts more, a greater premium on loyalty and discretion that you might find here in Ottawa. Well, first I'd say there, there has been a culture of openness here in Ottawa for most of the, the time I was reporting from here. Uh, I came, uh, came to Ottawa when, when Pierre, Pierre Trudeau was prime minister. Um, senior bureaucrats, uh, as most of you well know, if they trusted the journalist, uh, would be prepared to... Uh, give him or her as much inf information as they could because they, it was in their interest to see accuracy uh, emerge uh, in the news stories. Uh, th there was never a serious problem of, serious, of, of uh, senior uh, civil servants uh, being gagged. When Brian Mulroney came in, there was a period when there was a great suspicion of, uh, uh, of a bureaucracy seen as liberal. Uh, there was a very temporary so-called gag rule that some of you may remember that went into effect, uh, but it was completely disrespected by most of the uh, uh, most senior bureaucrats because, if they, again, if they trusted you, uh, they uh, they weren't prepared to uh, uh, to be uh, restrained in terms of the background information they were providing. So I think it's really only with the. Uh, the Harper government, and I, I'm not that well informed about it because I'm not a practicing journalist here, where uh, you really have a, a freeze on, on contacts that is taken very seriously by uh, civil servants because their jobs are at stake if they, if they talk too much to, uh, to journalists. But it's, uh, it must be immensely frustrating for uh, members of the uh, Ottawa Press Gallery now to function in this environment where it's, it's very hard to... Uh, to get information from the civil service or from, from cabinet. Again, in, in my time here, if you were working for the Globe or CTV or CBC, um, you could you had extraordinary access to cabinet ministers. You could call up their offices in the morning and usually get an interview if you needed it uh, in the afternoon, which was uh, was wonderful. And now, of course, uh, cabinet ministers have to check with the PMO. Uh, they're often given uh, given the scripts, the messaging of what they can say. So that, again, is a very frustrating uh, uh, aspect of reporting out of, 
out of Ottawa today. In Washington, yes, there's a heavy dependence on senior sources. As um, a foreign correspondent there working for, for CBC, um, it was very difficult to have that high level of access uh, because uh, you know people would want to talk to the New York Times or the LA Times or the Washington Post and so on. Uh, it was difficult to get uh, uh, access, confidential access to senior sources. What you had in Washington, though, was this amazing array of think tanks, uh, 50 or 60 of the of major ones, who were all anxious to make their uh, uh, their talent, their experts uh, available to the media. And if you wanted to do a, a report, say on the Kurds in northern Iraq, you could probably find, and I kid you not, about 40 or 50 experts in that field alone. And here in Ottawa, if you wanted to do the same thing, uh, I don't know, maybe you'd find one or two at the U of O or Carlton. Uh, but there's this uh, wealth, this embarras de richesse uh, in Washington in terms of the think tanks and their availability for journalists. Good evening. Um, I'm not of the older generation, but I am a civil servant. Um, moreover, I'm a civil servant who has served in two wars, uh, in a civilian role, um, in, Iraq, in uh, Afghanistan and in Libya. And I have a job to report every day accurately uh, to our government on what's happening around the world, uh, doing the kind of reporting that you've alluded to a number of times while you've been speaking. I've often found that I am one, um, I'm a two-legged stool. I don't have a key partner. And that partner is the absence of a journalist in the field beside us who's contributing to a nuanced, educated public debate in Canada about the policy issues that face us around the world. As you said, we're a trading nation. We are a member of NATO. We're a leading member of the United Nations. We have responsibilities. We are engaged on a number of fronts a number of times. You've talked about the difficulty in maintaining uh, co foreign correspondence overseas, the changing way information is, 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 is being uh, uh, absorbed by different people. But what you haven't mentioned is, do you think Canadians care? Do you think that there's a business market, uh, that there's a real uh, demand for Canadian-specific reporting, or is the lack of those opportunities reflective of a population that simply doesn't see those interests? Well, I would say first that there is definitely an appetite for uh, world news seen through, as I mentioned, the perspective of uh, Canadian reporters that reflect Canadian interests. Uh, uh, if only from an economic point of view, this is a trading nation uh, with vast ties uh, abroad, uh, there should be more. Um, Informed decisions need to be made on the political and economic uh, developments in the world. Uh, there's that market. There's the market of uh, this being a largely immigrant nation of people with many interests abroad. Uh, I really do think the appetite is there. Um, I'm not sure because of some of the factors I mentioned whether it's being satisfied. Uh, I think another aspect that I find a little depressing here in Ottawa is that we don't have the, uh, we have a few good defense uh, correspondents specializing in defense. Um, we don't have the tradition, the European tradition and the American tradition of having a diplomatic reporter. So I think foreign news as seen from here is uh, often uh, inadequate. Um, you look at, we have two or three former spokespersons for external affairs here who probably uh, share my views on this. Uh, we don't have the tradition of uh, the daily or weekly briefing on foreign affairs that they, they have at the State Department or uh, uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office or the Quai d'Orsay. Uh, and we do not have this um, volume of expertise here of people just focusing on uh, uh, giving a priority to foreign affairs. And I think, again, that's reflected in the lack of, uh, um, of detailed, comprehensive foreign reporting that uh, fails to satisfy the, the appetite you mentioned. How about one more, one more question, uh, one more question oh, I'm told? Maybe on a personal, more personal level. Thanks, David, for uh, <clears throat> relating uh, for your book and for relating these marvelous stories about your father and his uh, career in, in uh, as a war correspondent in international journalism. And I guess your son is also in the business. Uh, 
Uh, so maybe in a few years from now, he'll be writing uh, a book about you and your, <laughs> and, and, and your career and uh, wonderful experiences in this, in this, uh, in this field. Uh, I'm just wondering if any of us who have worked in the international environment in the last few years have any favorite David Halton stories uh, that, we, that we might want to share. Uh, I remember your coverage of Mr. Trudeau's visit to Saudi Arabia and Yemen in about 1980, probably one of many hundreds of trips that, by prime ministers that you've covered, and how you were intrepid in going into the desert with Sheikh Yamani and going up into the Yemeni mountains <coughs> to cover this story. And summing it all up, you said, uh, Pierre Trudeau, uh, the last Western leader to visit Saudi Arabia, because they were very powerful at this time, and the first into the Yemen. And I think uh, <clears throat> I also recall that the CTV reporter at that time uh, died a few months later in, in the war in, in Lebanon. So it, it all relates to you know, what exciting stories that, you're, that you've told and that you've lived. And I'm just wondering whether you have any that you would want your son to write about if he ever writes a book about you, about your personal experience. Uh, well, I hope not. Uh, firstly, because uh, uh, I had a great career, but it, it pales in comparison with, uh, with my dad. Yes, I enjoyed the occasional drink, but I had never had the occasion to liberate a city with the help of a, a beautiful blonde resistance fighter. Uh, which, <laughs> so that is hard to beat, indeed. Um, I'm sometimes asked, well, what was the most dangerous moment you had covering, uh, covering wars? And I had Vietnam and uh, uh, the war in Rhodesia and Six Day War and a, and a couple of others. And I said, well, actually, it wasn't in a war. It was, uh, it was when I was almost assassinated in Cairo. And it's a bit of a long story, but I'll try and shorten it. Uh, we applied for an interview with um, Anwar Sadat. It was when rumors beginning to surface that maybe he would uh, try and search for a breakthrough with, uh, with Israel. I was uh, in Jerusalem, and the London office calls me once saying, uh, we just heard from uh, the press office in, in Cairo that uh, you may be able to get your interview, but you've got to get to Cairo as soon as possible. So you couldn't fly, obviously, from Jerusalem to Cairo at that point. Uh, we took our car across the Allenby Bridge to Amman, uh, flew to, uh, to Cairo, arrived uh, fairly late in the evening, and uh, went through customs. And uh, once through customs, two gentlemen came up and said, um, we're from the Foreign Ministry Press uh, Department. We're here to take you uh, from the airport to your hotel, and uh, I thought this was great, and climbed in the in the car with the the cameraman, and halfway to Cairo, I said, you know, we, how did you know we were coming? We uh, we were only got our tickets uh, uh, that same morning, and they said, well, you are David Holden, aren't you? Uh, and I said, not David Holden, but David Halton. Oh, they said, uh, we were here to meet David Holden. David Holden was the senior. Uh, diplomatic correspondent of the London Sunday Times, uh, a man who was some thought might have a sort of Philby-like connection to, uh, to intelligence. Uh, in any event, uh, they, they said, well, we're halfway to your hotel now. We'll drive you there. They drove me there. Um, I did a radio broadcast the next day, waiting for the interview with Sadat to happen. On the second day there, um, David Holden arrived and was assassinated between the airport and his hotel in, in central Cairo. And uh, no one to this day knows why it happened, whether he was working for intelligence, whether it was the Muhabarat, the uh, Egyptian secret service that assassinated him. Uh, I was called in when I got back to London by uh, MI5, MI6 to, uh, uh, to give them my testimony, what happened to me. Uh, the investigation continued for months, but they never found out who the murderer was. So um, one aspect of this story was that a, a relative uh, in, in Alberta um, heard that this, and I thought it was me, he called my wife, who fortunately knew, I'd alerted her in advance that I was fine, and told her that rumors of my demise were greatly uh, exaggerated. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, David. Unfortunately, we're <clears throat> running uh, 
out of time. I'm sure uh, most of us might like to spend another hour or two here, but uh, it's not to be. So I'll call on um, uh, former Ambassador Abby Dan, who is also a former uh, Foreign Affairs spokesperson, to uh, give our thanks. Well, good evening, bonsoir. David, it falls to me the very happy task of saying thank you to you. Um, you've given us quite the tour d'horizon, both historically and thematically tonight. And I must say it's been really edifying and really astounding to put oneself back in the time when your father was a war correspondent and a pre-war correspondent probably in particular and what he must have gone through as a human being as well as a professional. But I must say, I think all of us know that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree in the Halton family. And um, I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank you for the great contribution you've made to Canadian society and Canadian dialogue, particularly in the area of international affairs over the years. It's really been stellar. I had the pleasure to work for a number of years with David uh, as a spokesperson. I was the I was the hack and he was the flack. <laughs> and um, without, without any exception, David was always unflappable, so professional, uh, so constructive, because sometimes there are uh, times when you have information that you cannot share. You know they have it too, but they can't let you know they have it. <laughs> And uh, sometimes lives are even at risk with this information. So you have to be very, very careful what you do. And as I say, David was just always impeccable and such a gentleman as well. I know all of the women of the uh, press gallery and all the spokes ladies felt this way about you. So it was, uh, no, but really not all of them were, believe me. <laughs> so um, on behalf of all of us here, I'd just like to thank you again for a really edifying talk and a really um, thoughtful uh, analysis of what's happening as well in journalism today. One thing I think is interesting on that level for us to think about is this whole idea of the individuation of news with the digital revolution and then the individuation of consumption of news and then how is this really agglomerating into social and political movements. And I think this is a very new area which a lot of our younger members will probably be looking at and addressing in their studies and in their analyses. And I think it's probably one of the really important new areas for research in, in journalism and, and frankly in political and social movements. Anyway, again, merci beaucoup. Thank you, Monsieur Halton. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes uh, the, the uh, presentation uh, session. Uh, dinner follows, uh, supposedly at 7.30, and I believe David will be available out at the signature desk for those of you who are not staying on for dinner and have gotten a book and would like to have him inscribe it. Uh, so thank you again, and uh, bon soirée.